All right. Good afternoon. I wanted to do a, a little bit of a discussion about hypothesis testing uh, and when to use paired tests, when to use uh, two sample tests. Uh, and in this particular example, what we're going to do is uh, work with uh, some synthetic data just so that it's clear uh, uh, what kinds of things we're we're looking at here. So no models involved. We'll just generate some synthetic data and and see what happens. Um, so first off, um, where I am working is uh, I've created a new space uh, with an extra notebook for you. Um, so an MLP skeletons probability, and there's a hypothesis test scale dot IPYNB uh, file. So make a copy of that. And then from here, I am able to navigate over to that. So there's the probability directory I just created, and there's the copy of the skeleton file. Okay, so uh, so we're it, it, we're going to um, really set up two different kinds of scenarios. One, in both cases, we're going to be comparing one synthetic model against another synthetic model, uh, and we're going to try two different situations where we have uh, the two models are uh, completely independent of one another. So, training and testing are are independent. So then we treat their performance metrics as uh, as being completely independent of one another. The other scenario, which is actually more common in a lot of what we do, where we're comparing model A versus model B using the same training validation test sets, uh, in that situation, we can uh, use, uh, use paired testing. And what what we tend to see is that the that performance of model A and performance of model B do tend to co-vary uh, to some degree as we uh, try different uh, data sets. So so we'll we'll set up those two synthetic scenarios and play with them. But first, I wanted to just generate some random data for us to to look at. Um, Uh, so np.random.rand uh, will generate uh, a set of random numbers for us. Um, in this case, I'm asking for 30 uh, random numbers. Uh, of course, make sure that you execute the imports. And there are your random numbers there. Um, uh, okay, so, so what do these random numbers look like. So let's plot that, plot a histogram. And we want um, bins to be something odd. So bins are 21. So that's, uh, so believe it or not, that's 30 samples taken from a standard normal distribution which oh sorry we called the wrong the wrong fun, the, the wrong method here um so rand generates random numbers uniformly distributed from zero to one what uh what caught my eye was that we were sitting in this range of zero to one and it looks like a pretty uniform distribution at least sparsely um what we want to do is sample from a gaussian distribution so rand n is is what we want and that samples from a standard normal distribution so mean zero standard deviation of one and that's what what we have here as far as our histogram goes again we're only sam taking 30 samples from this and so one really has to squint at this uh at this histogram to really convince oneself that we have a, a normal distribution if we opt the number of samples, say by two orders of magnitude, then it starts to look a lot more like what we're used to seeing with a standard normal distribution. But for now, since we tend to work in the 20 to 30 range for a lot of what we do in machine learning, so 20 fold cross validation, we're gonna stick with uh, 30 for now. So 
Um, one question is, what does the mean of this sample set look like? We expect the mean to be something around uh, around zero, but uh, uh, but we're not exactly at zero. We're at point zero five. Uh, let's look at the standard deviation, and we're at point seven five. So, uh, so the true distribution that we were sampling from. Uh, was mean zero, standard deviation of one. For this particular sample, the sample mean and the sample standard deviation are a bit different from that. Uh, if we repeated this process many times, uh, the distribution of the means across those many uh, iterations would actually, again, fall along a Gaussian distribution. Mean zero, the standard deviation would be uh, one divided by square root of the uh, number of times that we actually uh, uh, sampled from, from that distribution. Um, if I rerun this again, so get a new sampling, you'll see the histogram has changed just a little bit. And we'll also see that the mean and the standard deviation have changed a little bit. So the mean actually has shifted a little bit to the negative side. Standard deviation, it's interesting that we're still around 0.7. Okay, so that that's sort of the 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 warm up. Um, again, one of the big takeaways here is that when we're taking a small number of samples, the they don't necessarily look like the distribution that we're sampling from, uh, and we have to actually take a large number of samples before we can really convince ourselves, at least visually, that that this is representative of a sampling from a normal distribution. Okay, so let's let's uh, take a step now, and we're going to create two different samples. Um, in this first step, we're going to uh, simulate really no relationship between our A and B models, uh, but we uh, we're going to bias the the B model uh, by some mean offset that's declared uh, right here. So random dot rand n, we're going to take n of those. And if we sample from random dot rand n, and then, and then add an offset, this is equivalent to sampling from a standard norm, uh, a normal distribution, standard deviation is still one, uh, but the mean now is at offset. Okay, so let's let's do that. Of course, I I have to uh, make sure I am pulling from the right. Oops, this of course is with the, come from a NumPy. There we go. All right, so let's let's look at these histograms. Okay, so we're we're just going to drop these two histograms uh, on top of each other. Not not doing anything particularly special here. Um, so so as we eyeball this, um, we might see a small difference between the the blue and the orange. The orange feels a little bit more peaky, but that's just because there's this one extra count right near zero. Uh, the orange might feel a little bit shifted to the to the right, which is what we expect. So here, the code that I provided uh, will tell you what the, the sample mean and standard deviations are for these two samples, and then ask what the difference in means is. And so there we go. So um, both the standard deviations are in the 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 range. We expect a one. Uh, mean for A is 0 0.4, we're expecting zero uh, on average anyway. And for B, we're expecting not zero, but we're expecting this, this offset here. 
So, uh, so the difference, the difference in means for this particular sample of 30 is not quite what we were expecting. But if we were to rerun this procedure, so by executing this cell again, uh, we're, we're going to uh, resample those numbers. And we end up with a new distribution. And, and the standard deviations have changed a tiny bit. Uh, the difference in means is is a bit different. We're getting closer to that, that point too. And that just happens to be this uh, particular sample. If we increase N dramatically, so let's go to 3000, the, the, the picture starts to become much more clear. It, it really looks like the orange is to the right of the blue. And, and here that mean and the, the mean of the differences is that 0.257. So still not the 0.2, but, uh, but it is uh, closer into that ballpark. Notice the standard deviations now are more representative of the, of the standard deviation of one from the uh, distribution up here. Okay, so let's let's play with this offset uh, a little bit a little bit more. If I shifted it by 0.5, we're going back to 30 samples. Now it's really clear that there's a distinction there. If we actually compute those statistics, uh, the orange actually is shifted over by a full one unit uh, on average, almost full one unit. Uh, standard deviations are about what we expect there. Okay, and if we push offset all the way down to zero, then there really, on average, there should be no real distinction between those two uh, distributions. So notice the mean difference has now uh, uh, shifted to uh, something closer to zero. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's ask this question. So visually, we want to get a picture of whether or not this is a there's a any sort of covariance between these two. So we're just going to do a scatter plot here. Remember, you need to be labeling your axes, and and there we go. That's what. The set of the scatter plot looks like um, nominally. If we were to fill this in, um, what you would end up with is with a high density around at, at zero zero, and then it would the density would draw drop off at, with a Gaussian in either direction. So along uh, from here increasing in A and here decreasing in A. Likewise, here increasing in B and here decreasing in B. It would drop off as a as a Gaussian. So you can kind of think of this as you took that one dimensional Gaussian curve and spun it around uh, the zero zero point, uh, you would, uh, that, that's the, the shape of the density function that you would have for this, uh, this two variable Gaussian distribution. But, um, but looking at the, the scatter plot, uh, there really isn't, any sort of relationship between the A's and B's. And in fact, that's how we've constructed things uh, by setting up the, uh, by just doing these independent samplings uh, between uh, these two data sets. Uh, but let's, let's ask the question of what happens when we apply a statistical test. So, um, in, in this particular case, the the first element of A has no relationship to the first element of B, and likewise for the second elements, et cetera. So it's really appropriate for us be, to be asking uh, a two sample type of question. Uh, remember that the t-test is a test of whether the, the means are the same or not. Uh, so the null hypothesis with t-test and z-test is that the the distributions are the same. So the two sample t-test is uh, stats.t-test. So stats.t-test underscore end for independent. 
and that gives us uh, a uh, a p value. So remember the p value is uh, the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. So it, what this says is if we if we said no, there is no difference between these. If, if we if we chose the null hypothesis, which is that, sorry, let me back up. If we chose to reject the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is that A and B are the same distribution. We reject that idea. Then uh, what this p-value represents is the probability that we would be incorrect in that rejection. And being wrong 60% with 60% probability is uh, is kind of a scary situation to be in here. So, so here we would make the act of choice of not, uh, not uh, uh, of keeping the null hypothesis. The other thing that you want to be looking at is the difference in the means. And we, were, we of course had that up above as well, but I wanted to be able to put this next to the, the p value usually you're you're asking whether or not there's a diff a significant difference and then you're asking the question here of whether or not there's an important difference and it is it is possible to have a significant difference and yet it not be terribly important uh, and and really that importance hinges a lot on what these values mean the a the a's and the b's Okay, so th this is a result that we would expect given the way that we've constructed our data back up here. See, our offset is zero. So both of our means uh, are that we're sampling from are mean zero. And so we don't really expect there to be much of a difference. Um, there is a second test that one that we'll be using, but it's really not appropriate in this scenario, but I'm going to show you what the code looks like here. Um, so this is uh, our paired t-test and that is called rel. So t-test rel A and B. In, in, these, in these cases, uh, what we're really doing here is uh, taking the first element of A and subtracting off the, the first element of B, same for the next element, et cetera. So that gives us N different differences. And we want to know what the distribution of those differences is. And under that scenario, uh, for this particular data set, we would expect there not to be any real difference there. And so, in fact, you see that in the, the p-value here is also at 0.63. Okay, so let's let's ask the question of what happens when we start making changes to this offset. So let's increase the offset by just a little bit. And kind of the game here is, do you really see a difference between the blue and the orange? Actually, in this, this particular case, it does feel like the orange has been shifted by quite a bit. Uh, so the, the, P, the mode here is a little bit to the right of the mode of blue. And, and the extremes over here are shifted over from the extremes of the blue. So here our mean difference is 0.3. So actually that's a pretty big change, a pretty big difference. Um, looking at the scatter plot, again, there's no real relationship between A and B here. So, uh, and, and you just don't see that in the, in the data here. So, so again, that sort of suggests that paired tests are not appropriate. So let's ask what happens with our two sample uh, test. So in this particular case, you'll you'll notice that uh, the p-value is smaller than before. We kind of got kind of got lucky in in uh, how the difference of the means played out, but we're still at eighteen percent, which is still a, a pretty substantial uh, p-value there. Again, there's our our point three difference between the two. So in, in this particular case, p-value is still too high. Uh, the, the default for 
uh, for a lot of scenarios is that we have to have a p-value of 0.05 or below, 5% or below. Uh, you do want to be a little bit, you, it, it really depends on the kinds of errors that you're able to tolerate. So we talked uh, a few weeks ago about if, if you're trying to make a life and death decision based on this p-value, then you might actually want to have the, 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 uh, the alpha criterion to be much lower. So it's not uncommon to, to push that down to, to 1%, for example. Um, looking at t-test relatives of so the paired sample, that also does not show that anything interesting has happened here. And again, we, we don't expect that. If we were to rerun resample with that same offset, we might end up with something that's a little bit more comparable. Um, actually, we have pretty substantial difference there. Kind of surprised. Uh, again, there's there's not, and there there's some weird outliers which are kind of skewing things, uh, but there still is no relationship between A and B. And our two sample t test, okay, so our two sample t test actually in this particular case is way below five percent by an order of magnitude. And, and that is because for this particular sample, uh, it's it's actually the, the difference between A and B is pretty substantial. So we, we tried to build in a 0.05 difference in the means. And this particular sampling of 30 uh, from each of A and B was actually much larger. So in this scenario, our test would, we, we, we would accept this. And, and say that the, the difference in the means is this, even though the way we constructed the, the, the data uh, is is quite quite a bit different from that scenario. Uh, it's interesting that the paired t-test also uh, is below uh, 5%. Okay, so for fun, let's, so this should, this kind of thing should happen not with 5% probability, but maybe a little bit higher than that. Let's just for fun, let's resample, see what we end up with. So in this particular case, blues and oranges are a little bit more uh, on top of each other. So the difference in means is 0.12. There's our scatter plot. Things are a little bit more scattered uniformly around, which is what we'd expect. So in this in this kind of a scenario, I don't expect the the p value to be very high. So in fact it's 0.69. Jarmin and our uh, two sample t test is also not uh, not picking out anything. Okay, so let's let's start to push this out. I'm going to double our offset now. So the expected difference should be 0.1 between these distributions. And maybe that's what's happening here. In fact, the mean difference is 0.25. And you can, you can, uh, I'm not going to make that claim. Okay. So it, one might be able, if you're squinting, you might say, well, there's that outlier out there and, we don't have a comparable value down at negative 0.3, um, but the the shift is still pretty subtle here. So let's let's ask what happens with the two sample t test. So we're down at that 0.38. So this is not a significant difference there. If we were to run this a bunch of times, some of them would pop out as different, more with higher probability than 0.05, uh, but uh, that's, uh, but but that will be an unusual situation. I'm going to double this again, push that shift out. At this point, it should start to visually be obvious that the orange is a little bit more to the right of the blue. Although it's interesting, you've got this outlier sitting out over here. 
So the mean sample difference is 0.44. We try to, to force it to be something on the order of uh, at least 0.2. And, and here now you can start to see that if we drew a line along zero here, a larger number of samples are starting to migrate up above the, the B equals zero line. The t-test in this case is enough variance there. We're still at almost 10%. So we would still, uh, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, which is a double negative. We would keep the null hypothesis is another way to say that. Okay, so let's let's increase this again to uh, 0.3. And again, we can see there's starting to be more of a visual shift there. And think about what's going on with respect to the B equals zero line. Still not a significant difference between the two, but but they're starting to, to separate. Let's increase this up to 0.4. And in here, very there's a very visually distinct difference between those two distributions. And in fact, the mean difference is 0.9 now between the two. There's your covariance. And again, the points continue to shift above the B equals zero line. At this point, I'd expect, yeah, the two sample t-test is, is saying that this is really quite significant. Again, the paired sample test isn't really applicable here, but you can see that it is pulling out uh, a real difference there. Um, when you're reporting p-values, you should not be reporting uh, reporting these really large uh, numbers here. Uh, uh, large in terms of number of digits, because we're not actually measuring things at that level of precision. Really, this is um, one, two, three, four. So this is a little bit above three times 10 to the minus four. Um, however, when you're reporting these numbers, you you really need to, uh, it's important to round these up. Uh, so I, I might call that four times 10 to the minus four uh, or 3.1 times 10 to the minus four, some, something along those lines. Since we're substantially below the criteria, four times 10 to the minus four is, just as good as 3.1 times 10 to the minus four. Um, okay, so um, if we run this again, let's resample here. We would hopefully more often start to see differences. That's not a, as huge a difference as before, or at 0.3. Uh, and in fact, the p-value is is still too large to uh, reject the null hypothesis. And notice that you're in this situation, your paired sample t-test is really tracking what this p the the two sample t-test is doing. Uh, let's sample again. So again, there's some visual distinction there. Okay, so that's that's three different samplings, uh, one of which was statistically significantly different. Um, actually, a good exercise is to write a for loop around this and do this a bunch of times for one offset and then change the offset. And you can see as that offset increases, the probability of choosing to reject the null hypothesis will start to increase. Um, to kind of force this situation, let's move the offset to 0.5. And there, that feels like there's a pretty big difference. I mean, difference is still 0.3. 
and it, it actually did not pull that that difference out. So one of the things to, to take away from this process is, is that there's a real, um, it, is that when we're working with small ends, 30 in this, in this particular case, uh, the difference between the A case and the B case really has to be pretty big before we start to uh, be able to show us a, a real distinction uh, from a, a formal perspective. So I'm going to re rerun that again. In that case, the mean difference is points, it's almost 0.7. It's interesting that the standard deviation of of uh, A is so much bigger than B. So you can see in this case, the uh, the p value is at 0 0.01, so 1, uh, 0 0.014, 0 0.015. Uh, so that's a statistically significant result. If we let's let's go to the extreme here and set the offset to one, so doubling that again. And here it should be pretty convincing looking at these two different histograms that there is a distinction. And in fact, our mean difference is on the order of one. You can see that B equals zero line sits way down over here now. So most of the points are above. So this is 9.7 times 10 to the minus five. I would report that as 10 to the minus four. And you'll notice that the paired sample test uh, also also pull, uh, comes out as significant, although it's not as uh, the, the p-value isn't as as small as what we have up here. Okay, so if we if we rerun this a few times, I would expect at this stage, with that offset being so large that most of the time we're going to see a distinction between those two distributions. So there we go. Our mean difference is 1.1, a pretty substantial, uh, substantially small p-values here. Let me run this one more time just to be, just to kind of drive home this point. Again, very visually distinct. Mean is differences uh, is one, and we have a statistically significant difference. Okay, so so it's important that you're you're looking at both things, whether there's statistical significance, and if there is, then you can start to interpret this as to whether or not that's an important difference. Um, if we're uh, oftentimes we're evaluating this with respect to the uh, if, so if this is RMSE so units of I don't know theta uh, radians uh, or degrees uh, we would end up really kind of comparing this difference of means against the the range of uh, theta values that we see in the data set. And if this is really small, if it's 1% or 2% or of the full range of the data, then even a statistically significant result is not necessarily uh, important here. Uh, but if this were on the order of 10% difference or 20% difference, then a statistically significant result is, is meaningful. Okay, so so that so this is all in the context of completely independent, independently drawn data. The only difference is the means are are different, and we had to push that offset quite a ways apart uh, between the two distributions before our statistical tests started to pull these uh, these apart reliably. Okay, so let's we're going to. Now look at uh, constructing a paired sample test. Uh, and for this, let's 
we'll start out with an offset of zero. Um, let me do a, uh, I'll define what mix means here in a second. So, so A, should really call this A1 and B1. Um, these, these are, uh, so A1, it's, it's sampled in exactly the same way as before. Um, B1, we're going to make it set, configure it so that it is a blend of some random value, some randomness and what A1 represents. So, and plus an offset. So we're gonna add an offset here. Uh, uh, we'll multiply mix times A1 and one minus mix times a new random value. So, um, so what I mean by this is with mix set to 0.5, uh, half of B1 is, is, is exactly equal to A1. And then we're adding in a random value. Again, it's, it's, it's half. Um, so the result of well, the, the, this resulting random variable is, uh, it is mean offset the way we've constructed it and it's standard deviation of one. And the, when we achieve the standard deviation of one, because uh, because of this weighted sum of a random variable that also has a standard deviation of one and a random variable, again, that has standard deviation of one. Uh, and this, the weights mix and one minus mix, if you add those together, you end up with one. So we preserve the standard deviation. Uh, so let's, let's look at those histograms. Oops. Uh, apparently my keyboard is not matching my fingers today. All right, so there's our our histogram. And and there is, for both of those, there's some shift, um, but uh, we're not really seeing to, some shift from zero. Um, that's not entirely accidental. Um, but these two distributions, the blue and the orange themselves, could actually have been generated by our previous procedure, uh, the, the way that we're looking at those. And in fact, if we ask now about uh, the means, um, so the orange is shifted a little bit more to the right than the blue, I, a lot of that I think is controlled by this point that's way out here at negative three. So that's kind of, that's a really unusual sample from a Gaussian, standard normal Gaussian. Um, standard deviations are still in the range of, of what we, uh, of what we want. Um, but um, let's, let's look at the scatter plot now. And even though this might be something that we expect from the same the previous procedure, what you'll notice is the scatter plot now is is different. Uh, so there is a weak covariance now along the the y equals x line between a and b. Can't you kind of have to squint to see it, but but there is uh, a weak one there. So, so let's try, let's look at this formally. So there's our, uh, our t-test, our two, uh, two sample t-test. And it says that there is no distinction between the two. And just for reference, let's look at the difference in means again.
So, so it's a fairly substantial, uh, a fairly substantial uh, difference there. Um, however, our two sample test where we're treating the A's and B's as separate entities, it's not put picking this out. However, by construction, some some of the variation of A1 is being reflected in each of the samples uh, in the variation of B, B1. So, uh, so this is actually a, a scenario where really a, uh, a, a paired t-test is appropriate. So the first element of A has some relationship to the, the first element of B, second element of A to the second element of B, et cetera. And, and this is the idea here is that we're simulating the scenario where we have the same training set for model A as we have for model B, and we're using the same test set for model A as we have for model B. So let's look at the t-test for this one here. So here, um, so th this is our uh, paired sample test. Here, we're not seeing a distinction uh, either. But again, that's kind of by uh, construction. Let's, let me show you what, what mix does. So I'm gonna set mix to 0.75. So that's increasing the influence of A1 onto B1 and decreasing the additional randomness. So there's the two distributions. So there's not really anything to, to see there. Um, there sort of seem to be uh, really overlapping, but look what, what happens in the covariance or scatter plot here. Now you can really see this relationship between uh, a and B. But still the the mean the the means are about this the the underlying distribution, the means are still the same. Uh, for this particular sample, the difference in means is actually about what we saw before. Um, but our, but here our two sample t test is is saying that there's not a uh, there's not a relationship. Let's uh, see what our paired sample t-test. Um, it also says that there's no relationship, but notice that that value is a lot smaller than what we have here. So it's it's really picking up on this covariance. So let's let's start to play. Let's play with the offset here. And when we added 0.05 above, I think we had one case where we ended up with a sampling where A and B were significantly different, but uh, but for subsequent attempts, we didn't see anything. So there's our histogram. Not really much to see there. There's our scatter plot and our t-test. So in this case, the difference of means, the sample means is relatively small, so I'm not really expecting anything there. Let's let's push this up to an offset of, of one, of point one. So this kind of model this models the idea that the B model is on average point one better than the A model. Can't really see it there's not really a difference in the in these two different distributions. Uh, the mean though the, the difference in the sample means is one. You'll start to notice that as we look at this B equals zero line, more and more points are going to start moving up to above that. That really hasn't happened too much here, but let's look at what the, the, oh, my apologies. Um, I've been executing this cell and it's, referring to the wrong data set. So definitely a cut and paste error there. There we go. So now our difference of means is, is equal down here. And look at that, uh, that p-value. So, so now our p-value is actually below 
uh, below our critical threshold. So it's down at 2.5%. Uh, whereas our two sample t-test is, uh, is still sitting way above that critical threshold. For fun, let's let's re just re-execute this. Can't really see a distinction here yet. Our difference of means is really small, so we're probably not going to see a different distinction between these two examples. Yeah, we we're not seeing a st statistically significant difference. Let's try this one more time. Mean difference is 0 0.08, which is not all that big. So again, we're not pulling out a distinction there. Okay, so let's let's move our offset up to 0 0.2. And by the time we hit 0 0.2 in the above example, we're starting to see occasionally statistically significant differences. I might be able, if I squint at this hard enough, I might be able to see it a shift of orange relative to blue. Um, but it's not really a very large uh, shift. The covariance. Um, however, our t-test is actually pulling that difference out uh, pretty in, in a pretty substantial way. And again, notice that the two sample case uh, is giving us p-values that are much smaller, or much, or way above critical threshold, whereas we're below the critical threshold here. Let's run this again, just to see if that's a consistent result. Mean difference of 0.25. And again, we have a statistically significant result. So, uh, so if you repeat this a bunch of times and compare it to what was happening in the above construction, um, what you're going to find. So first off, remember the two sample t test. Uh, the two sample t test is appropriate when the a and b's are completely different from one another. The paired sample test uh, is. Uh, and you you can in this particular scenario you can use the two sample t test, but because there is a relationship between the individual example, the, the statistics from A and B, the, uh, the the paired sample t test has a lot more power than the two sample test. So so it can more quickly pull out a statistically significant difference uh, between models A and B. Uh, as we slide that that offset further and further apart. Remember, we had to get that offset pretty large before our two sample test would actually say that there's a difference. Um, and yet here, our, our difference is still, the offset is still at, at 0.2. Uh, this, so if we run, if we run this one more time, Who's to say whether we end up with a difference, a significant difference? So yeah, so we're still uh, below the critical threshold. Uh, so there's very much of a relationship in the way we've created this artificial data. There's very much a relationship between the offset and this mixing parameter here. So they, the the closer mix gets to one, the more B1 relies on A1 and the and you get closer and closer to that Y equals X line uh, in the scatter plot. Uh, as mix gets away from one, then you start to you have some amount of A, uh, but uh, but now you're bringing in some additional randomness. And uh, as you change mix, so if we go back to 0.5, this offset, this difference of means might not be as uh, as consistently significant. So let's try that just for fun. So there's our scatter plot. Notice the variation along this axis here. 
So we expect this variation by construction, but then there's this variation across this axis that has gotten a lot wider by changing mix. So actually in this particular case, we do have a statistically significant result um, because the, the difference of the sample means is actually quite large. Um, let's try it one more time though. And in general, I don't expect this to be as consistent. Although there's another attempt where, uh, where we are picking out a, a difference. And in fact, the, the two sample test is getting close to, to saying that there's a difference there. All right, so this is the hazard of doing examples on the fly here. So there's one more. The difference is 0.36, which again is is uh, has a pretty substantial p-value here. So okay, so so this for for this offset of 0.2 and a mix of uh, 0.5, we're still getting a significant results. Uh, at least with a, with an n of three, we're we're uh, seeing statistically significant results consistently. If I change this mix, if we shift it down to 0.25, at some point this relationship will break. You can see that the, the you can actually barely see the covariance now. And, and uh, there's a lot more variation along the orthogonal axis. And at this point, at this point now we've, our uh, two sample, or sorry, our paired sample test is not showing up as significant. Okay, so I, I encourage you to play with this a, a bit more. Think about maybe implementing that for loop where you're for a given mix, you're trying out different offsets and how often do these uh, give you statistically significant results? That, that would actually be a nice plot. Um, but, uh, but to wrap things up, um, that's what these three notes are all about. And um, we're really, uh, so so fundamentally, um, we're interested in answering the question about uh, whether the models we're building now, our approach to building models, will actually work with future data, uh, assuming that the distribution of the future data is something comparable to our current data. Um, if if that's the kind of question we're trying to answer, then then uh, using these hypothesis testing uh, measures, so that's what I mean by statistical testing here. Um, it only makes sense to uh, be applying those to the test set uh, performance measures. Uh, if you're asking a more limited question, uh, so so one of uh, don't worry about the spelling error there. Uh, if you're asking more uh, limited question, which is given the data that's sitting right in front of me, uh, uh, then you could technically use these hypothesis testing uh, mechanisms with your validation set, but it really it really doesn't say anything about what would happen in the future. So, so in other words, it's not really the, the correct kind of question. Uh, because fundamentally we care about future performance. Uh, it's important uh, for us to make sure that we're using the right statistical tests. So here we've been using two different varieties of t-test, a two sample test and a paired uh, sample test. Uh, and which one you choose, you need to make sure that it actually matches the uh, the uh, scenario that you're that you're expecting. And and again, for a lot of what we're doing in this class, when we're comparing model A to model B, we're actually uh, we're actually using the same data for each one. Uh, and so a paired sample test is is appropriate. And as you saw, it, it can be a lot more powerful. Um, also, 
in general, you need to make sure that you're treating your test set data as a really limited and precious resource. Uh, so anytime you uh, compute performance metrics, again, spelling error there, uh, anytime you're computing performance metrics with respect to your uh, test set or computing, doing hypothesis tests with your test data, in, in some sense, you're taking away the power of that data to actually tell you about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and, and, and so this is why I, I advocate that in when you're doing lots of trying out different types of models, different hyperparameters, you should be looking at your training data and your validation data, but you always leave your test data for the, to look at the very at the very last instant. So uh, ideally you're looking at it once, you're using it once. And in that type of a scenario, you're being very honest with yourself and with uh, the individuals that you're presenting the work to uh, ab about uh, the, uh, the 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 true result and what it says about future data. Um, there are scenarios where we might do do multiple tests uh, with our data, uh, or compute different metrics and do tests on the different metrics with the same data. In those scenarios, if you're actually writing a thesis or you're writing a paper, uh, you really have to be honest about about that. And then you have to do appropriate statistical correction. So this is the, the Bonfroni idea. Uh, there's a Bonfroni correction and a SIDEC correction for the kinds of p-values that we're worried about. These, these, two, uh, these two different approaches kind of do the same sorts of things. Uh, but, but the larger takeaway is never use your test data to make model decisions. It's tempting to... Uh, to as you're creating your models to uh, to to store that test data uh, because it's it's just it's easy to cache it at the time that you're building the models, uh, but uh, but you should never peek at at the uh, data. And every time you do, again, you're 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 taking away the the power of what the test data can can tell you about the future. Uh, and then finally, uh, the cross-validation procedure that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks and you're experimenting with right now in your homework assignment, uh, this is a uh, a process this is a process that's meant for dealing with scenarios where you have very limited kinds of data. So you, you can you can see in our uh, in our sensitivity analysis where we're varying the uh, the size of the training set, that we're kind of on the verge of uh, not having enough data uh, for the kinds of models that we're uh, that we're actually training up, and we're having to take some pretty substantial steps to to make sure that our models are performing consistently. So this is where our hyperparameters are coming in. Uh, uh, so so if if you so 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 again, this is the scenario. Cross validation is appropriate for scenarios where you have small amounts of data. Uh, if you have lots of data, or you can sample from from the universe uh, uh, without much cost, uh, then really the ideal scenario is is for each of your n models of type A to use different training, validation, and testing data, and then and then use that same data for model B. And that, that'll give you statistically uh, more meaningful results. Um, with cross-validation, we've talked about stratification. Uh, you want to make sure that each of your N folds is, uh, is representative of your full data set. So, uh, so if we're talking about a uh, a classification problem where you only have a few examples in your data set of one particular class, then it's really important to make sure that those are distributed evenly across your n folds. Um, otherwise, you you can end up with some really skewed results for uh, for for your uh, training, validation, and testing uh, metrics. Uh, 
but the the other thing to be watching out for though is that you're making sure that you're creating your folds so that they are statistically independent of of one another uh so in time ser- with time series data if you're not careful uh, and you're doing a cut and uh right before the cut temporally is a small amount of time difference from what's happening right after the cut uh then you uh th- then then you're starting to induce some statistical dependence uh between the different folds and so you can get end up with some skewed results there for the brain machine interface data that we're working with we've cut things very strategically so that they're one could make a good argument that there are independent there is independence between each subsequent fold all right so that's that's it for for now and we'll get back to uh back to uh training up our decision trees here next time thanks all